Okay, so welcome to today's webinar, which is titled, Who is Reusing Data and, uh, sorry, Who is Reusing Data, Successes and Future Trends? Um, broadly, what we're going to be looking at is what we know about the current state of play around data reuse, um, what researchers can do to increase the reuse potential of their data, and we're going to consider some future developments in data reuse. Um, we're really pleased to have two great speakers for you today. Um, first, we have Louise Corti. Louise is an Associate Director at the UK Data Archive, and she also leads the data services teams there. In Louise's talk, she's going to explore the reuse of UK data service data sets. Um, she's going to share some good practice examples and look at some principles we can use to make data more reusable. Um, our second speaker is Tiberius Ignat. Tiberius is the Director of Scientific Knowledge Services, which is a company specialising in helping European libraries to embrace new technologies and new ways of working. Tiberius is going to discuss the growing case for data reuse by machines and look at the possibility of granting machines data reuse rights. So it should be two really interesting talks. Um, so I think we're ready to get started with the first talk. Just a quick reminder, please post any questions in the chat and um, over to you, Louise. Thank you. Can I just make sure you can see that okay? Can you? Yeah. Yeah, see my screen. You can see the full screen, yeah? Good, excellent. Right, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, it's really exciting to be part of your, your full week. Um, and it sounds like it's, um, it's always a, a popular thing that you run. I think Cambridge really, really excel at actually doing, do, doing the, the data events. So I'm very pleased to be, to be speaking on day two. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the RN Fair. And this is kind of the, the reuse, what people are doing and how you can make, um, how, how you can make any data that you do create as, as uh, reusable as possible. And I'm going to be focusing in on examples from, from our data service. OK, so just in case you don't know what the data service is, um, it's a data service for the social sciences funded by the UKRI, um, Economic and Social Research Council. It's been funded as an archive for about 55 years. So actually this is the next incarnation of what was the original ESRC data bank in the 1960s. And it's built on its small collection from to, to be a really quite large collection. Um, it provides access for uh, research and teaching and it has trusted digital repository status, meaning that it's a long-term preservation house and it uh, it's, um, has um, information security standards so they can hold personal data as well. Um, it works very closely with research funders to make sure we operate the research data policy for the ESRC and with key data producers, including government departments, to make sure we're bringing in really valuable data that may not be curated elsewhere. Um, there's around 8,000 data collections um, and they range from completely open data to uh, data that's available in our safe haven. And just to tell you a little bit about the portfolio of data, um, I, I guess our biggest collection is around the, the, the national social surveys. And we're very fortunate in the UK that we have a very good flow of um, data sets coming in from central government as they're collecting them. That thing, that's things like the very large scale health survey for England, the labour force survey, the crime survey for England and Wales. All those data sets, um, which are national um, samples get, get sent to us within six months to a year to make available free of charge to the research community. So we're very fortunate in the UK to have this wonderful data. We also have some really nice uh, longitudinal cohort studies, the National Child Development Study, the um, Understanding Society, some really powerful um, time, time studies that some going on well over 20 years. And again, um, they're some of our best used data. There's a large qualitative collection of about 1,200 studies, mostly coming in from academia. And there's um, aggregate, aggregated data from the UK Census and some historical databases that actually are mostly digitized versions of uh, historical materials. So just to talk a little bit about the R, um, 
we are uh, we're going to be showing you a little bit about how how to have really well documented and trustworthy data so that can be reused in a hundred years time let's say and to make sure it's fully curated and, and preserved then there's the issue of citation to make sure that we actually know what we're um, we're using and the fact that if it changes we can keep track of that as a reuser and then going to move on a little bit about if you are collecting data how you can promote your data collections and how you can kind of show off um, show them off and, and for people to get the best out of them so that when they come to reuse it, it's not that not, not a difficult task. Um, we also show users what's been done with data so they get inspired by some of the, 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 the examples of what, what's being done on the data. And we also try to support re re reproducibility as well. So here's an example of our catalogue. It's just a screen dump of uh, the kind of front page of the catalogue record, the top part. Um, and that's and the, it, each of the 8,000 collections will get a landing page, which will have some basic um, potted description of the study, like most catalogues. Um, then they will have on the left some uh, structured metadata about the coverage and methodology, and we use the data documentation initiative to document the, um, the description of the data. And that's standard, standardized across all of the other data archives and services around the world who have things like social surveys. And then there's a very clear access statement there, and that's the A in FAIR, that it's really clear to people about who can use it and how they can use it. And that's important as well. And then finally, we have, uh, in terms of the R, there's some quite detailed user documentation. So users can dig in, they can find out which kind of documentation files are available. That will include the, um, the user guides produced by the survey producer or by the data owner. Um, and they're normally, if they're a major survey, they're going to be really quite high quality and they'll be produced in a book-like fashion, in a PDF. There will also be, uh, on the bottom right, a whole list of variables so you can see exactly what the data are. And then on the top, we have a, a read file where you can see any particular issues you need to know about the data as a reuser. And with any updates, they will be updated to reflect anything, um, anything that's changed. In terms of reuse and, uh, and persistent identification, we have a DOI here, um, which is 105255 and a study number. And um, the two there reflects changes to that particular study. So this example we're looking at here is the second issue of Understanding Society because it's being updated on a, on a regular basis. And if you click on that persistent identifier, you will come to a jump page that tells you the, the history of the change. And that's really important because it basically says that the reason this is version two is that we made some changes in July and here's what the changes were. So in terms of reuse, you have absolute clarity on which version you're using or what's been done. And that's quite important. In terms of other linkages on our catalog page, we also have a link to related resources for users and that anything that we've gathered around understanding society, which we, which we think users might find of interest. And um, that will be other related data sets that's linked to that data. It can be some case studies that users have, have um, published or we've helped them publish on what's been done with data. And then a list of publications coming out of that. We try to, cut, to keep track of those as well. So what's the most popular data, you may be wondering? Well, of the 8,000, it does tend to be um, those large scale studies that have been going on for some time. So you may have a time series of them there, they're, you know, so, so you're able to look at trends over time. They will have a national coverage. So they'll be surveying the, um, a sample of the, the, the UK population. And they will be from a trusted data provider, like a high quality data provider, like the Office for National Statistics, or like one of the field agencies like NAPSEN. So um, high quality data collection, excellent methodology, and, and a large scale studies. These are by far our most popular data sets. And if you look at the table below, this is for um, 2019, I think. And, and for all those data sets that came in that year, these are the most popular data sets. So um, the ones that came in in 2019, um, Understanding Society was top, followed by some of the other longitudinal studies, and then some of the, um, the government surveys like the Health Survey for England and the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. The quarterly labour force survey is always a very popular study. And there will be topics as well that will trend. And as you can imagine, COVID-19 has been a massive um, splurge in people studying it because it's so critical to everything we do uh, across all, all branches of social science that is 
definitely what I would call a, a trending topic. Somebody asked me in the audience um, about qualitative reuse, and because we have about 1,200 studies in our collection, um, we did a, a large piece of analysis, it's about five years ago now, looking at um, who was using qual data and, and, and whether it become a popular trend for analysing secondary, secondary um, qualitative data. What we do is when we went to the Web of Science and we looked at the terms like reuse, secondary analysis, qualitative data, and you can see it's a wonderful trend, really, isn't it? That um, by 2015, it's actually quite a few publications that mention that methodology, whereas in 1990, there was, there was almost none. So that shows that there is a popularity in the method itself. And I really like that um, graph. I might always wheel it out as well. I don't know about the last five years. I'm hoping it hasn't gone down, but I don't, I don't think it has. Um, so in terms of sort of downloads um, of qualitative data, we're looking for the last sort of 10, 15 years, you know, around 900 downloads. So it's definitely gone up um, and it's kind of, um, I would say averaging really. And then again, for the kinds of things that people are doing, uh, about 64% of the uses of qual data are for learning. So they're for dissertations for students and also for research. Um, I guess less for teaching, but predominantly really useful for teaching and learning around qualitative methods. So how do we predict these kind of trends and themes? You know, how useful is data going to be? How do we decide whether to promote some run workshops when you've got so many data collections? And it's often, a, a, it's often down to requests from the data owners to say, we'd really like to have a workshop on our health data to try and promote it. So I guess the more proactive you are with wanting to push your data out or doing something creative with it or engaging with, with potential users, then it's probably gonna see a rise in popularity. Um, and just to say, in terms of the trends with COVID-19 data, we've ingested about, um, well, there's 134 mentions in our catalogue, even since April, which is actually quite amazing. Um, and that's the, just the number of big studies that have been ingested over the period. Um, and we've done, well, the, the field work's been incredibly fast moving. So many surveys have gone to online and telephone methods instead of face-to-face. -face, and we've managed to turn them around really quickly. So it's very impressive in terms of rapid data collection and making this available quickly for the research community. People can get their publications out there. And as you can see, there's been quite a few publications already and we quite try to keep track of those, but people are publishing really, really fast. Um, this has really accelerated the academic timeline absolutely substantially, it's, it's, it's really quite amazing. So I'm just gonna now get on to putting your promoting hat, your impact hat on your data. So um, how can you make your data set popular and, and reused? Well, I guess, first of all, to make sure it's properly um, curated, it's got its DOI, it's got really good detailed descriptions. So someone attending it, coming to it for the first time will actually have a really good idea what it is. And that includes some well-presented user guides rather than lots of bitty information. So seeing it as a kind of book, if you enter it with a little bit of a narrative, I think that's a really nice way to introduce people gently to the data set. And it is hard to get to know data sets. It can take quite a long time. So there are ways that we, we kind of promote data. Um, firstly, when a data set um, co comes into the collection, we try and see if it, it can fit into our thematic web pages. So obviously we now have COVID thematic pages and we have the new COVID data sets to that page. So if people say, I'm just interested in health data, they can obviously put health into the catalog to do a search, but they can also go to this health page and have a look at the kinds of data that are there. Um, we also collect case studies um, from users. So if we see that people are using things or they come forward to say they want to write a case study, that can be uh, an impact one, which is more kind of policy relevance. It can be on how they've used it in their teaching. It could also be a story of how a depositor has actually deposited some data with us that may be difficult or challenging. And I think that they're, they're very valuable. We also run lots of data events and data dives and often in combination with the data owner and of course we've got an impact blog and Twitter campaigns where we can work together with data owners to push their data out. Um, just some examples here, the one on the left, that's our data impact blog. We often get people saying we'd like to, to write something on our data set so we can either write it with them or they can be a guest blogger. Um, we always have a news release on new data sets, um, maybe not some of the smaller ones um, but there will certainly be a feed onto our GISC mail about updated data in the last month, but also if it's a bigger study or it, it's a bit more innovative, we'll actually do a news item on it. We tweet, clearly. 
Um, this is our health page down here. Um, so you can see that there's uh, this is our, our thematic page on COVID data. And then our case studies are thematized as well. Um, and they're added um, according to the theme. So they're all ways of um, kind of showing what's being done with data. And actually the data owners really like case studies and the, um, the funders do as well. And in terms of events on the, on the left, there's a, a, a constant stream of events happening. We do have these user conferences about five a year where we focus down on a particular kind of um, data collection, for example, the labor force or health. And um, we, we run a user conference where the data owners come and uh, people who've reused the data present and we have a, a whole day kind of interactive sessions and, and breakout groups so you can put the owners and the users together. And then we've had a data dive recently. This was an academic who'd actually created some COVID data and wanted to do an exploration. We have webinars on thema themes of data and also um, we record all our webinars and put them up so people can go and re-listen to them. So there's lots of different ways of kind of promoting data. Just on to the, because I'm aware of time, onto the reproducibility part. And I know that I think you've got another session this week on reproducibility, but I thought I'd just go back to the way that we, we try and help with reproducibility. As we all know, um, it's coming very fast. It has been for the last two to three years, and there's lots of replication policies already for some of our social science journals. I think sociology really, really isn't particularly visible there at the moment. And I think there's lots of interesting ethical um, debates really around, you know, what does transparency and, and reproducibility mean for qualitative uh, research? Is it undermining it? There's lots of really interesting topics we can discuss. <laughs> but obviously, there's so many ways you can be reproducible. And I think data services can help by asking people to, to register, you know, at, at least data sets and, and related code. We do have a data availability statement on the page I showed you on access, and that can be used when you're publishing to say, and, and point directly to that page so that um, users can see how to get, get into the data to reanalyze it. Um, for political science journals, you, you may know, but there's something called the Access and Research Transparency Statement. And um, many journals signed up, up to this statement and aspiration very, very quickly um, and rules for implementation, which means if you are publishing in that field, you really do need to make your code available, your data, your replication data, and again, data services can help support their academics by lodging some of these goods um, in their own repositories. Just to say that um, in terms of transparency, the, the data initiative I find really, really um, very, very clear because it separates, separate out types of transparency. And I think focusing on the top one, obviously we need to be um, saying which data we're using, where it comes from, which version it is. The analytic one is also much harder. One needs to tra trace back your finding back to the data set, you know, showing the code. And again, if, if variables have been derived and the code's been, um, and, and, co and code been derived, it's really useful to make that available and maybe uh, as part of a, a data set if you can, your own data set. And then again, this process production transparency, you know, how, how did you choose though? How did you choose your research design? What did you do? That's hard to, hard to explain, but that can be done in probably the narrative of the paper. So um, just to say in terms of transparency, reproducibility, this bit is what we do at the data service. This is what the researchers need to do. And, the, and sometimes these, data, these, these, these replication data sets are a subset of data, but they can be problematic in themselves because they can be decontextualized. And I think actually to go and reuse something so, partial snapshot of a, a larger data collection can be very difficult. And I think in, in time, if you start to lose track of the replication data and the main data set, then, then that can be problematic. So I, I think that has um, some messages really for what, rep, what publishing a replication data set looks like. And we would recommend at the data service that really one should um, try, and, try and publish the whole data set or as much as possible at least saying what, even if the data set isn't all um, made available, the metadata says what, what's been collected, which bits are available, which bits aren't and why. So you've got a full story of the kind of reproducibility within the metadata record or in some documentation. And then again, um, you know, you can also then add a replication data set um, and that can be linked to the, to the whole data set. And I think that's really, really very useful. And again, um, much of the research data from papers is still not available. So we still have, a big hole in, in, the, in the data that really does need to be um, deposited. 
There's so many wonderful data repositories now out there. Cambridge has a great one. There's really no excuse for putting some kind of record in there, or, and even if it's not the raw data, you can put something in. And um, hopefully, I've shown you some ways to to put the impact hat on your data and try and get it reused, and to show that if you want to go and reuse some of our data, there's lots of interesting information showing how it's been done and what you can do, and also training to help you get started with with some of those data sets. Just to show you what um, some archive code looks like, we do actually archive quite a lot of code. And um, people say, I've got this um, syntax, this code that I did for deriving some data from the quarterly labor force service. Shall I archive it with you? And we say, yes, that will be really useful. Then users can go and have a look and see what you've done. And sometimes these are really complicated derivations of things that people have created, like histories. Um, and so they're really valuable, but they, they do come with a disclaimer, I guess, that they're often created not by the data owner, but by somebody else. So use at your own risk, but really useful for other users to actually have these bits of code available. I think they're really nice. And just finally, I'm just going to say something about, um, we have a, a self-deposit repository with about 2000 data sets in there. And this is where the smaller sort of long tail data go. Um, this is just an example of one. It has very similar metadata. But what this one has got is got a data paper um, attached to that. And this is where the data um, producers went in and they wrote a paper which brought, um, brought to life their data set as well as archiving it and gave the story of how they collected it, what they did, what was innovated in, in terms of the data collection. And I think these data pa papers help provide the impact for, for a data set that's archived. And um, I've been the editor of the research data journal for humanities and social sciences for two to three years. And we have about um, 15 social science data papers in there. And I know that people find it really hard to write them, but I would just suggest be brave. Um, you know, you don't need to reference that much in there. Just put the impact hat and try and, and, try and sell your data. And that, that's kind of really nice way of, of, of giving a different spin on a data set rather than very detailed um, documentation. So I hope those whiz through um, tips um, uh, have been useful. Um, um, that's it for me. Thank you, Louise. That was a really interesting talk. Um, we've got some questions we can go through in the discussion. Um, we're kind of behind schedule time-wise, so I'm going to go straight into Tiberius's talk. So over to you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Yeah. Hello? OK. Um, Hello everyone, it's great to share this space today and I feel honored for contributing to Cambridge Data Week 2020. Thank you for, of course, inviting me. Um, when I received this invitation to, to speak today, I was invited uh, by the Office of Scholarly Communication and recommended to talk about the use of data and reuse of it uh, from the public angle. For example, how is data sharing contributing to citizen science? Uh, then, of course, I, I discussed with, uh, with Cambridge Office for Scholarly Communication and I changed a bit. Just a bit on the, the original subject a bit. Um, just for a short while, I recommend the work of Jitka Stilund Hansen from Technical University of Denmark as a starting point. Uh, research data management challenges in citizen science uh, projects and recommendations for library support services. Their findings will be released soon and more studies are emerging in this area, so, so please stay uh, tuned. But I suggested indeed to, to the Office of Scholarly Communication a completely different uh, perspective from which to look at the matter of reusing research data. It's repurpose for by machines and the possibility of granting data rights to these machines. I'm gonna change again a low third. Humans are weak at peripherals. We don't have the best vision. Our arms are not strong enough and we don't hear weak noises, just some examples. So first we invented some physical devices to help, up, help us then we realize that we are not good enough to calculate, to remember things or to combine information. 
So we came up with something new, digital solutions. Let me be clear. We could be happy with all these solutions and devices. The problem is that we don't know where to stop. Once Mahatma Gandhi said, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not even enough for everyone's greed. The same here. After building machines to help us with our weak peripherals, we started to create another kind of machines, algorithms, to guide us through life. The, the first were recommendation engines. They grew up in matchmaking platforms and became then creatures that deliver micro-targeting and psychographic profiling. The latest are trained to persuade humans. These machines stay, I don't think it's a secret for anyone, at the core of platform economies, like social networks, online commerce, uh, news platforms. They also penetrated the core of democracy, the election processes and public governance. Did I mention already that we don't know where to stop, right? Not only that we created such non-human persuaders, but we designed them to pretend they are humans. Recent technological breakthroughs in artificial intelligence have made possible for machines to pass as one of us. A couple of years ago, a well-trained human used to recognize their perfect grammar, maybe a, a bit lengthier sentences, but how are we doing it now? Well, Emilio Ferrara is the data scientist at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles and he studies social media robots to understand how they can change people's belief and behaviors. In a recent interview, he was asked how effective are these robots of spreading disinformation? And I, I have a feeling that some of you are familiar with these things. We learned from uh, Emilio Ferrara that four years ago, people retweeted content originated by robots at almost the same rate at which they retweeted content originated by humans. Today, the number of um, users retweeting robots has dramatically diminished. But wait, he couldn't say if the internet platforms are doing better at detecting these persuasive robots and suspending them, or that we can no longer identify them. This is something extremely important. My message is very clear. Mach machines, sorry, should not be allowed to persuade humans. Research data should be kept away from persuasive machines. Build machines for something else, but not to persuade people. It is unfair. I think, to be honest, speaking about me, I have, I have a fair chance to remain in control when another person persuades me, another human, to buy something, to vote for someone, to turn left and not right, things like this. But I know I have almost no chance for myself when I am persuaded by an algorithm which is set for that. This robot will know a lot about me from my digital footprint. And even if I gain an up apparent confidence that I remain in control, I have a great doubt that I will be good to train my son and my daughter to retain control of their activities in a world infested with such robots. And older generations have the greatest difficulty to survive such attacks. Share data with responsibility. What has everything to do with research data? I use this opportunity to speak with you today and to try to convince you indeed that no research data from public projects should be available to feed and develop these persuasive algorithms, the non-human persuaders. This is an invitation to all researchers to start attaching the right licenses for the reuse of their data sets and to ban their data to be used by non-human persuaders. I don't see any good reason for which researchers should continue to contribute to perfection, the art of machine persuasion. I realize that my presentation is about how not to reuse your research data. I wish I was in the position how to say how to reuse it. Unfortunately, I'm convinced that we are in that set position in which we need to know how to correct now an existing wrong practice rather than designing it from scratch. 
well, it, it, some harm, I think it was made already. So I, in a way, decided to take this very narrow approach today for speaking about research data and persuasive robots. Instead of telling you what to do for reusing the data to, to tell you or to suggest you what not to do. Protect your research data from persuasive algorithms. I work uh, in a research project which involves citizen science. I like citizen science. The project is relatively big with 11 partners spread, uh, spread across Europe and is led by Coventry University. We want to better understand how are we tracked by default when we are using internet and mobile apps. One thing we can say so far is that how amazed we are by the level of surveillance, human experience, most of the surveillance being perfectly European GDPR compliant. Have you noticed how hard it is to manage your internet cookies? Have you noticed that once again, we started to lose control of, your, of our cookies under the small screen of legitimate interest? Share data with responsibility. We see it as an epic battle for data, which is the grassland for robots. These persuasive robots lose their orientation without your data. And those that need these robots have no intention to abandon these doubtful practices. So I'm asking you once again, why would you like to contribute to the development of such a system by allowing your data to be used for questionable purposes? Here are some, uh, just two examples, which I hope will invite you to consider how to reuse your research data. Today, healthcare decisions are uh, often informed by algorithms. They are called AI-assisted clinical decision tools, algorithmic decision tools for healthcare and similar. Based on some algorithm, your doctor is informed about a decision she needs to make for your health. This is a widespread reality in developed countries. These algorithms rely on a massive research and clinical data. The most advanced ones are supposed to use research data from both science and humanities because the social context of a medical condition matters for both diagnosis and treatment. Well, I, I, I do support, that's clear, the path of using research data to build AI for, for healthcare. But as long as it doesn't use persuasion technologies, if these clinical decision robots will be programmed to persuade robots and through some capillarities to persuade patients as well, our society will become a very dangerous place to live. How far are we from such situation? I believe we are inches away. If we don't take action, if we don't make sure that the availability of research data becomes a tool to protect us against human persuasion, non-human persuasion, we lose an important opportunity to keep our society safe. A black box algorithm, which persuades a doctor to place a person in a healthcare program, sounds like a dangerous thing to me. Doctors, like all other trained professionals, should be supported in their epistemic authority and not misled or even worse, undermined. So once again, data reuse, protect your data from persuasive algorithms. The second example is uh, from scholarly communication, more precisely from content syndication platforms. Some of these platforms are used by researchers in, in my opinion, in orders of magnitude more than library services. I don't, I don't want to suggest that there is a malicious intention behind scholarly content syndication platforms. I believe they started with honest intentions. But as they choose the path of non-human persuasion, they should know that they took on board a responsibility larger than what humans were or are able to comprehend. There are a number of publishers that associate their current business strategies to content syndication in such persuasive platforms. A particular attention is required towards those publishers, but also libraries that apparently linked their open access strategies to content syndication and to content platforms that employ persuasive algorithms. We need AI tools to improve researchers' activity. That's clear. Tools for lab notes, for data sharing, for improving academic writing, 
some experts think think they, these AI tools will learn from training data generating by annotating research articles. And in my humble opinion, from man machine supervised learning for data curation. But there are bigger ambitions laid already on the table. Same ex experts think that the bigger AI projects in scholarly communication have the apparent goal of automating research more broadly, particularly in the area of hypothesis generation. This is something that I want you to think very careful about. Do you agree with persuasive technologies embedded in such algorithms that stay behind research content syndication and even more that could influence the hypothesis generation in research? Are you confident that a research environment controlled by a handful of persuasive algorithms which can, will continue to serve the interest of the broader society? If this is your answer is no, why would you make your research data available to be used and reused by persuasive algorithms? AI indeed needs to ingest a massive amount of data to develop. Probably a good indicator is to look at what cookies are collected by these platforms and what legitimate interest a user is required to agree by default. This is not a proxy to learn about the level of persuasion, but I think it could be considered at least a modest indicator. I'm happy to discuss this in the Q&A session. So once again, data reuse, I put it clear. Um, among first things to, to, to consider is to protect research data from persuasive algorithms. I anticipate that some of you will ask whether my presentation is relevant for today's state of research data reuse. My answer is clear, not only that it is, in my opinion, but through actions that we take now, we might be able to discourage for, for future undesired actions in the reuse of research data. So act now. If you don't agree that non-human persuasion is already a great threat for humankind, then at least I invite you to become preventive. The art of persuasion appears in the first pages of human history. Now, aliens, and I repeat, aliens became real characters in our history book. Before I close, I, I invite you, if there, in the chat box, you may find already a, a link to a two questions poll. I'm happy if uh, you decide to take part this poll is not made by the uh, and run by the Office of Scholarly Communication at Cambridge University. It is run by uh, myself, and I thank you once again for allowing me for um, running it. Thank you once again for your participation, listening to this presentation, if you have been, and I am very happy to, to engage with you in further discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Tiberius. Um, it was a really interesting lens to look at data reuse through. Um, raises a lot of interesting philosophical questions, I think could promote hours of discussion, but we're kind of running short on time. So we're gonna dive straight into the questions. Um, so the, the first question I have here was, um, targeted specifically at Louise's presentation. Um, inference from survey data requires to take into account sample selection, non-response correction, and measurement error. It requires heavy documentation on all the sample design and data collection. How do you provide that in a unique place? Um, that would normally be provided by the data owners. For example, um, Understanding Society has whole um, user guide on waiting, which deals with all the different types of um, non-response waiting, um, sample selection. So that's normally provided as critical documentation uh, under waiting. But I think for some of the smaller studies, then often waiting hasn't, weights are not provided for those surveys. And I think that can be problematic, but, but I think for any of the large scale government uh, social surveys, there will be normally really detailed information. Uh, it, it could be a chapter in the user guide. It could be a self-standing um, report on waiting. 
but we would hope that experienced users and statisticians would go and consult that because obviously it's really important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we had one more question about the, it was specifically about the study using Web of Science. Um, was it published? Yes, I'm going to put it in the chat now. I just, just it's, luckily it's open access. Isn't that good? Open access week. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. That's a piece of work that we did about five years ago, just to have a look at the, the kind of broad use of qualitative data to see how it's being used. I think those sort of studies are really worth doing. Um, they take a little bit of time to, to dip into all the information, but I think they're really valuable kind of snapshots of how things are being used. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to open these questions up to both of you. Um, this is one I kind of anticipated. So what about ethical algorithms to promote equality and diversity? Um, I was also thinking about um, what about algorithms used to persuade people, for example, to improve their health behavior. So I guess really positive uses of algorithmic persuasion. Shall I start with something very basic and then Tiberius can give probably a much more in-depth intellectual answer. Um, in terms of some of the data science projects that are going through, for example, using government administrative data, the ethical safeguards are really quite strong. So as well as the kind of research topic and the data use going through, the algorithms are being um, scrutinized at the point of the, um, of the ethics committee. So it's not just an ethics committee meets once before a project's approved to go forward. It needs to be an iterative cycle of um, checking um, think the, the code that's being produced, the algorithms along the way, as well as some of the outputs to make sure they're not damaging. So I think we do need to, to look at ethics as a continuum that can't just be written off in a rec approval and then you go. It's got You've got to scrutinize these things really carefully. But that's obviously in more of a controlled environment in academia where we do have more control over what academics are doing, I think, out yeah. there. Um, it's obviously much more much more difficult to, to keep control of what about what what's ethical and what's not until it's been published and you scrutinize it. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely good to take into account that ethics isn't just something you should kind of tick off at the beginning and then forget about. Um, so Tiberius, do you want to add to that? Yeah, yes, I um I, I do agree that it's good to to remind people to take medication, for example. I don't put that in persuasion. Persuasion is, uh, or uh, non-human persuasion rob robots, uh, the, the algorithm of uh, make, making a, a reminder for a person to take the pill. It's, uh, it's a basic algorithm that's not sophisticated. The algorithms I was speaking about are more sophisticated. They are looking to data to understand the behavior. And these are not, a pure work of engineers to make the programming, but is um, is a business model, and it's it's a, a a way of changing behavior to people. So it's on one side side is the the engineers teams that are creating um, a platform to which you interact and designing it in a way to send you constantly signals in a in a direction. So that you start to, uh, to empathize with that direction and to, to decide for a certain conduct. And on the other hand, there are uh, people employed to study your uh, behavior and to make, not from the engineer's point of view, from, from the programming, for, from coding point of view, to make the platform attractive, but to make the platform attractive socially. And uh, this is not only about the social media. It's, as I gave these two examples, they have nothing to do with social media. Uh, they, they could create a sympathy for uh, acting in a certain way in more professional environments. Like for example, um, syndication platforms for reading scientific content or for clinical decision, um, AI clinical decision uh, tools. Uh, so it's not a, only about uh, social media. And another somehow bias, which is uh, regarding these algorithms, is that we think that they are created by uh, private companies for uh, uh, online commerce purposes. 
and this is this is not the case this is a bias there is a certain a certain amount of effort on that side but these algorithms are used now also by governments governments not only in those countries where we think that democracy is not so strong and they are also used in healthcare so the way you design this algorithm is much bigger and where they are now is much bigger than a, a simple reminder for the benefit of someone who needs to be reminded to take a, a pill and then the check uh, these algorithms usually are in a, in a black box so the the checks that Luis mentioned before they are uh, welcome of course but they are mostly I assume they are check, checking if uh, these algorithms are biased if the data set that stay behind the obvious one that stayed behind them um, is uh, equitable enough to, to take samples and to, to, to decide behavior that could be considered a pattern. Uh, but the way you implement and the way you persuade, the, the way you convince people to do certain things is much more complex and it, it requires a continue, continuous observation. And it's especially important when these algorithms, they take the role of infrastructure and it's out of control and the governance is not so easy to be reached. Yeah, so I, I guess you're saying um, people should should be aware if they're being persuaded by an algorithm and, and the majority of them, of people probably are not aware at times when they're being persuaded, especially on social media, um, I guess. Which what I wanted to, to say and, uh, the dark principles, which I hadn't heard, which kind of distinguish different types of transparency. What, what I want to make clear is that I agree that the research data should be available for more researchers and for, for, for more people, including outside of research circles. Mm -hmm. And I want research data to be as open as possible and as close as necessary. There's no doubt about that. I want to, to have this transparency. But in a way, allowing, and I think new licenses should be created, allowing a data set to be used by a persuasion machine, I don't think it's a good idea. And we can share the, the data set to others and still banning persuasion machines to use it through licenses. Yeah, um, we're kind of tight for time. So I'm going to dive into another question, which I'm going to put to both of you, because I think it's a really interesting one. Um, where is the dividing line between permitting openness and closing off access? Is there a formula that can be used to ascertain whether a particular approach is acceptable or not? I go, go first on that. That's, um, that's a really tricky question because there is no formula. And if you're talking about, I think we're talking about disclosure risk here, about what sits between something that's truly open and unproblematic and what's shut down. And obviously, data could be locked down for a number of reasons, including commercial interests, patents, uh, as well as disclosure risk and, and, and risk to people who, um, who've been told the data won't be shared. So from, from, the, from the, um, the kind of commercial side, I think that's much easier to do because you can actually lock something down and then invoke some commercial licenses around how they can be used. But then the decision about use can often sit with the commercial owner and they may have a disinterest in people using the data. So it can be difficult to put these barriers in place and to think whether the decision making about whether people should have the data is, is fair and equitable, and I don't think it always is. I think the other side, in terms of judging disclosure risk on data, that, that is difficult to do, um, but we use the principles called the, the five safe framework, which allows us to take to scrutinize a data set to say that if it cannot be made open and therefore it's safe, you can put a number of different safeguards in place to protect that data, including um, having projects scrutinized so that they meet public good, so they're ethical as we've discussed, and so that they're methodologically sound, um, having um, researchers trained to, to use these environments properly so they can be deemed to be safe researchers and follow the protocols and understand what breaches mean if they do something wrong. And then safe outputs is where you may uh, go the next stage where anything coming out of these safe environments where you're using, for example, personal data, 
the outputs can be scrutinized to make sure they're not revealing any any identities so there's a kind of um a framework of different me different measures we can use depending on the risk but deciding to publish something on an open license or even with a, a lightweight barrier can, can be very difficult to do. And I think we have to err on the side of caution if we're talking about data based on people or organisations or households. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there is a distinction that we need to, to learn and to decide on it about opening a data set to, make trans to, to create the necessary transparency to understand the a research conclusion and to have a data set the same data set to keep the example for being um, being available for reuse and un for which purposes. So I think between these two things, it it is a uh, it is a distinct di distinction, and we need to understand it and we need to tackle it. I don't think we have yet decided when a data set could be open, and this is another conversation maybe that we should hurry up to decide or to to to. To, to, to make sets of recommendations when a data set could start to become open. But there are two purposes again, to verify a conclusion or to be, re to be open, to be, re to be released, to be re reused by others. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got about five minutes left. So I'll just pick one more question. Um, a very broad question. Um, what what may be the pros and cons of dedicating your career to mainly reusing data, especially as an ECR? So is creating new data more exciting and likely to attract grants, I guess is what it's touching on. Shall I go first from, from the social science side. I think it really depends on discipline because economists tend not to collect data. They, they reuse existing data, whether, whether it's aggregated data from government sources or international or, or some of the business surveys. They spend their life developing models based on secondary data. So they really don't do primary data collection. Whereas um, as an anthropologist probably will go and do that. So it very much depends on the discipline. And I think for an anthropologist, being told that they can't collect any more data will be very difficult. But of course, I mean, the COVID situation has really thrown us all into a very, very different um, mindset because we can't go and collect the data we perhaps wanted to. That's, that's more restricted. Um, and so I think more people are turning to secondary sources. Um, so, so it very much depends. It, it very much depends what you want to do. If you're an ethnographer or a qualitative researcher, it, it is harder to use other people's data because it takes a lot of effort to get to know their data set and the reflexive process they've gone through. But on the other hand, I think maybe using a complementary, going to do some data collection and using some existing materials to base or compare can be really, really useful. But it really does depend on the discipline. I mean, there's no way that a researcher could do their own clinical trial, but if they were using looking at clinical trials, they'd be, be using very large data sets. So um, yeah. I appreciate the question, but it does depend where you're coming from. Thank you. Would you like to I, add anything to that one, to be? I think the more the more transparency we'll have in research data, the more quality we'll start to have there. So these data sets will become more relevant for other studies or for for similar um, studies. Um, However, I think uh, making a career from reusing data could relate with uh, a study. I could only found one study that is speaking about uh, idle research. And it, that study suggests there are $4,000 um, billion which are now dormant in idle research. Of course, this is not only related to, to, to data sets, but you can imagine how much is in um, how much value is in data sets that are no longer used. If the dormant IP is four thousand trillion dollars, uh, four thousand billion dollars. So uh, uh, I, I think there are certain opportunities to to reuse data, and the more transparency we'll have in in data, in research data, uh, the more quality we'll find there. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, okay, we're going to close off now with a short poll, which um, Maria, could you launch the poll, please? So if everyone could just uh, select an option, that'd be great. Can everyone see the the poll on the screen? Yeah, hopefully. I'm quite enjoying seeing the answers moving up and down. <laughs> Seem to be leaning towards number three at the moment. I feel like we need a countdown timer with some music. Dominic, shall I end it now? Um, yeah, we've we've got ninety four percent. Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll end it. Thank you. Okay, so clearly number three is the most popular option. Um, so the main future development we need would be certainty that data reuse projects are seen as equal to data generating projects when it comes to career. So um, Tiberius and Louise, would you like to share any closing thoughts on the result of that? I think that's as to be expected, really. It's kind of closest call between all of them, isn't it? There's, it's quite, quite a variety, but as we said before, it, it, if if it's felt that it's more exciting and innovative to go and collect data and that that's still prevailing in some disciplines we do need to change that and um you know i, I don't think that is true across all disciplines but certainly it, it must be reflected in the audience here who don't feel that it's quite right in, in their own discipline so I, I would agree with that yeah i think all of those things are really valuable i think we need to do things as well as as somebody said on the um on the chat trying to think about the culture across some disciplines uh, to, to encourage it to yeah, culture is uh, something that came up in yesterday's talk as well. Um, Tiberius? Um, I think when funders, specialists, to start with them, should understand the cost of um, making data fair. I know that there were studies showing them the cost of not sharing data over 10 billion uh, euros uh, per year in Europe alone. Um, but I think they should be very clear about the costs uh, that are associated to make data fair. And they, all these costs um, are perfectly justifiable and they, they, it, it's worth investing this money. I still don't see how they decided about um, positively about that when they approved the, um, the new framework program in Europe research framework pro program, Horizon um, Europe. Um, but uh, that, that is answering um, or is somehow um, showing the results of these polls because in putting money in, in infrastructure, making um, building 
uh, on the cultural change, the, the, the management of this, the current culture takes money and then the infrastructure and all the a system which is able to check these data sets, which is able to automate processes. Again, as I said, I'm not against a AI at all. Um, I'm against those that persuade through AI. Um, all these things cost. And although we have a great number of events and conferences to speak about fair data and to speak about open science in general, I think we are not at the right pace to make this uh, cultural change to, to, to be produced. And one reason is because resources are not yet allocated. And that th this is how I read the results of this poll. Um, in, in this mix, in this context of suggestion, suggesting uh, resources for making data fair. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we're out of time now, so I'm going to finish off. Um, my colleague has posted some information in the chat. Um, a big thank you to everyone for attending and thank you to Louise and Tiberius for your talks and participating in the discussion. Um, yeah. We have quite a lot of other questions which we didn't get a chance to go through. So we're going to do a blog post for the event and we'll uh, address some of those further questions. We're also going to share the video and the slides and just a reminder that we have another three sessions this week. So if you haven't signed up, um, please do so if you're interested. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.